Well, hello everybody. Good evening and welcome to this uh, RSA webinar. My name is Meredith Doig and I'm president of the Rationalist Society of Australia, which is Australia's um, oldest free thought group. And uh, um, just before we get going, um, let me just say that about uh, a month ago, uh, Sky News got its knickers in a knot because YouTube suspended its account ostensibly for spreading COVID misinformation. Uh, the Sky News digital editor, a guy called Jack Horton, uh, described YouTube's action as, and I quote, a disturbing attack on the ability to think freely. I think he might have meant the ability to speak freely because I'm not I'm sure he could think freely. Anyway, um, and then today uh, we've seen um, a lot of uh, the, the so-called freedom protesters take to the streets uh, of Melbourne. Well, at the RSA, we are vitally interested in the ability to not only to think freely, but to think critically. Now, I must admit, I'm not really a fan of American style free speech absolutism. I do believe that there are limits to what you should be allowed to say. You can't just say anything you like. Of course, the classic case is uh, you're not allowed to yell fire in a, in a crowded theatre. But um, when there is times of national crisis, um, is the, the limit, the line of what's acceptable to say in public and what's not acceptable, does that shift? Well, this evening we, of course, have with us um, just the person to speak about these issues, Dr. Margaret Simons. Um, Margaret is an award-winning uh, freelance journalist and author. Uh, she's written political biographies, um, Penny Wong, Malcolm Fraser, uh, Kerry Stokes, and her long-form articles have appeared in many uh, publications, including the Monthly and, of course, the Age and Sydney Morning Herald, Inside Story, and so on. But not only is she a practitioner, but she's also been very closely involved in creating the next generation of professional journalists. And having worked with some professional journalists, I have some appreciation of the skill that's involved and the knowledge and the expertise that needs to be instilled and the values that need to be instilled in professional journalists. Um, so she's an honorary principal fellow at Melbourne University's Centre for Advancing Journalism and she's a founding director of the Public Interest Journalism Initiative which um, uh, does research and um, undertakes advocacy um, on media issues. So Margaret is not only very well qualified, but she's also deeply experienced in all, the, all aspects of freedom of speech. Now, she will speak for about half an hour, <clears throat> and then we'll work through the questions, some of which have been sent in beforehand. Um, but as before, um, if you do have questions when, as Margaret's going through her talk, could you please uh, write them in the chat box and then when we get to that point um, I will go through as many of them as possible. We may not be able to get through every single one uh, but we'll get through as many as possible. So Margaret I'm going to hand over to you. Okay thank you very much for that introduction Meredith and um, sadly what a, what a day it turned out to be to speak mm. about uh, political speech, um, when it's permissible, when it's not, and how we're going to navigate what lies ahead of us in the rest of this pandemic and indeed in the various other troubles that I fear lie ahead of us. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the issues that Meredith just outlined, um, and then I do want to talk about um, some of the issues raised by our current situation and indeed today. Um, for the most part of this, I don't really have strong conclusions. I, I am wrestling with a lot of these ideas myself at the moment. 
Um, but as a journalist, of course, I've been dealing one way or another with human rights, and in particular, the right to freedom of speech for most of my working life. Um, and I think I am more free speech than many people seem to be these days. Um, I mean, I don't like that term cancel culture very much because I think it's overused and, uh, and used in a particularly political way, which I don't find entirely honest. But personally, I am prepared to be deeply offended rather than limit another person's freedom of speech. And I think it's important. And I actually can see the connection that Jack Horton made, although I don't agree with him on other things when he said that limiting freedom of speech was limiting the right to think freely. That's not actually a new idea. It was first proposed by Milton before the British Parliament when he made one of the great speeches in the 1600s in favour of freedom of speech. He said in order to think we have to have a right to access all the information which enables us to think. And that was one of the first great defences of the freedom what we now would call the freedom of the press or freedom of the speech. Of course, there were no newspapers back then, but pamphleteering was a thing. And that was one of the first great defences of that principle. So I do think there's a connection there. I think if we can't speak freely, it is more difficult to think freely. And that's why it's so important and why I personally am prepared to put up with a great deal, but not everything, <laughs> before I would argue the limiting of freedom of speech. Mm. Um, so before I go on to that and sort of try and tease out some of the issues, I just want to draw attention to the ways in which things are changing. And again, I don't necessarily want to say these are good changes or bad changes. I think they're, they're a bit of both. Um, but once upon a time, the um, ability to limit somebody else's ability to be heard in the public space was held very largely by media proprietors. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, um, Fairfax, now Channel 9, um, the ABC and BBC, of course, if you're in the UK, uh, public broadcasters, large media companies, by and large, people who owned a printing press or had a broadcasting license. And in our own time, that has changed substantially. And that's why YouTube, being able to censor Rupert Murdoch, has been allowed to happen because the people who increasingly hold that ability are those who own our technology platforms, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Um, about a quarter of Australians now get their news and information mainly from social media, and many more use social media for part of their news and information needs. And that figure is increasing really fast. Interestingly, the fastest growing population that are using social media for news and information is the over 70s. So while it does skew young, it's certainly not exclusively young, or maybe it's just that the young are getting older. Um, and I think that changes things because it equates the right to speak with the right to be heard. So I can go and stand on a soapbox outside Victoria Market, perhaps, or I could um, put together a petition um, I can write to my MP, I can do all these sort of traditional pieces of citizen activism. But if I want to be heard, I really have to use either social media or the old fashioned media to be heard. And once upon a time, if you'd written a letter to the editor of The Age, for example, and it didn't get published, you might have been annoyed and fed up. You might even have had some conspiracy theory about why it was. But you would have been unlikely to say that your freedom of speech had been interfered with. And yet increasingly, as Facebook and Twitter and the other social media platforms struggle with their new power over speech, um, when they refuse to amplify speech, mm. people say this is an attack on freedom of speech. And that's a change, I think. That is a, a really significant and technology-driven change to how we think about freedom of speech. It's not the first time technology has been crucial in this debate, of course, the invention of the printing press absolutely was a huge technological intervention and you kind of knew it was important when you know Martin Luther's ideas were distributed the length of Europe within a few weeks and posted on church doors that was able to happen because they were printed 
Um, and then, of course, the Pope began to get upset when people were talking about translating the Bible into English and publishing that. And before you knew it, they were burning books. And that's how you knew it was important. And all that happened before newspapers started. So my point is just that freedom of speech, the right to speak and the right to be heard has always been tied up with technology and it remains so in our own time. But we have seen this huge transfer of power, which I think raises the question of whether the right to freedom of speech also means the right to be heard. So when Twitter, for example, boots Donald Trump off its platform, it's interfering not with his freedom of speech, but with his ability to be heard. Now, is that something that we're happy to have happen to the US president? If it's Trump, we might all say, well, yes, thank heavens. But what if it happened to Biden or to Barack Obama or to some future US president? How do we feel about that? Do we really want the power to be in those hands? Is it better or worse to have it in those hands than to have it in the hands of a Murdoch or a Fairfax, for example? These are difficult questions. Um, so I also just want to talk about the limits of freedom of speech. Um, Meredith spoke about that classic case of uh, not having the right to shout fire in a crowded theatre. Um, and that's a really interesting case. It's a 1918 judgment of the US Supreme Court. It actually wasn't about fire at all or arson. It was about whether people could mount demonstrations against conscription. Hmm. Um, and the conclusion of uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes in the court was that because it was a time of war and therefore there was a clear and present danger to society, it was, despite the American Constitution, which of course defends freedom of speech, much more so than our own Constitution does, it was permissible to limit freedom of speech because it was a situation of clear and present danger. Um, now, if we turn to our own times, we might think, are we currently in a situation of clear and present danger sufficient to justify the limiting of freedom of speech? This is assuming you agree with Oliver Wendell Holmes and mm. not everybody does. Um, now, Sky News was suspended from YouTube because it was uh, broadcasting material that was untrue or deceptive about the coronavirus epidemic. Um, content that variously suggested masks weren't effective in containing outbreaks, that hydroxychloroquine was an effective treatment, um, and that vaccinated people were as likely to die from the virus as the unvaccinated. Now, some of those things, of course, go against the scientific consensus, and arguably we should be allowed to question the scientific consensus, just ask Galileo. Um, but some of them are just plain wrong. For example, the death statistics are just plain factually incorrect. Mm -hmm. So do we regard ourselves as able to limit the freedom of speech of people because of this clear and present danger of the pandemic? Well, one of the problems of this, of course, is that we haven't had very much time to talk about this. Normally, if we were going to take such drastic action, um, limiting people's human rights and civil liberties, it would be a, a long process, I would suggest. In a democracy, we would expect some sort of debate. Um, I was having a discussion with my son a couple of weeks ago about traffic rules. We all, broadly speaking, um, agree with and sign up to and either obey traffic rules or accept that if we don't, we will have to be the consequences, likely a fine or something of that sort. Um, that's a real restriction on our liberty and on our freedom of choice. But we have, as a society, agreed to it. And it's been done, you know, boringly. I don't think any headlines were written on it, but through a democratic process in which parliaments pass laws, which set these things, and there is broad consent to them. Um, we have had no time to do that in the current situation because of the current emergency. And so trying to think about these issues recently, and, and this I think is relevant to what's happened in the last few days in our beautiful city, um, is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Far from a perfect document, of course, it was written at a particular period of time in the post-war period. Um, if you read it, and I have re read all of it in the last few days, um, you'll well, I got offended by the fact that it was possible to, to write something called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and use any male pronouns. <laughs> um, and there isn't a female pronoun or any other kind of pronoun through the whole thing. So it's all about the men. But anyway, leaving that aside, 
if we're asking what do we understand to be human rights, um, it's as good a document as we're likely to get as having that sort of broad acceptance, at least in liberal democracies. And so I think most of us are probably um, familiar. I just saw that message saying I need to move closer, so I will try and do that. I think most of us are probably familiar with the first bits, um, which, you know, Article 1, for example, talks about all human beings are born free and equal, if only that were true. Um, and Article 3 says everyone has the right to life, liberty and security of person. Um, but I had forgotten or maybe never knew the bits towards the end. Um, Article 29, for example, which says everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. And it goes on to say that limitations should be only those determined by law to protect the rights and freedoms of others and the general welfare in a democratic society. Now, it seems to me in our current situation, we are really navigating the area between those first articles, which talk about everybody's right to life, liberty and security of person, and that last bit, which is about the duty to the community. And that is not easy. It's a really difficult conversation to have, and we have had no time to have the conversation. Now, this is relevant, I think, to what we've seen in Melbourne in the last few days, because, of course, uh, freedom of speech is not only things you might write or say, it's also things you might do. And there's lots of case law, both in Australia and the United States, to make it clear that demonstrations are a kind of speech. Mm. And also, indeed, that not speaking is also protected by the American Constitution, for example, it's been used to protect people who don't want to stand and sing the national anthem or um, don't want to recite certain uh, texts and so on. So not acting is also a kind of speech, which at least in America is protected by that. Um, so it seems to me this is the territory we are in at the moment. Now, to talk about mandatory vaccines um, goes a little bit beyond what the blurb for tonight said, it's not actually about freedom of speech. But I think most of us, certainly I do, I'm strongly pro-vaccine. My kids are all vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated with AstraZeneca. I have persuaded friends and relations to prioritise getting vaccinated. So I'm strongly pro-vaccine. But I am queasy about making it mandatory. I really am. Um, it seems to me to enforce people to accept a, a health treatment, a medical treatment against their will, crosses a line which worries me. We're able to do it at the moment because the Chief Health Officer has powers under emergency legislation. And interestingly, the most recent, the only really significant uh, test of those powers, in this case in Western Australia, was when Clive Palmer channel, uh, challenged before the High Court his ability to go into Western Australia. Now, the Australian Constitution being the sort of boring and bureaucratic document it is, he had to, uh, it was an argument about trade. The Constitution says trade and intercourse between the states should be free. We don't have any sort of brave um, declarations of human rights in our Constitution. But the High Court, in deciding that case, applied something which previously it has applied only to political speech. And that is, it said, yes, you, the Constitution says intercourse between the states shall be free, but we have to look at the laws which limit that freedom and decide whether they're proportional and fit for purpose. And if they are, then they can be legitimate under the Constitution. And hence, they found against Clive Palmer. Now, because lots of people dislike Clive Palmer, I think the significance of that decision has in many ways been missed. But it implies, it says loud and clear, that all of our rights are contingent. Like Oliver Wendell Holmes said, it mm. depends on the situation. It depends on that balance between duties to the community, a state of emergency, and rights and freedoms. And so we have, you know, in a big rush, decided that some pretty big rights and freedoms can be given up in the case of this emergency. So we have various emergency powers um, in legislation. And of course, what 
the difference between us and an autocracy is that these are laws that have been passed by elected parliaments. But under public health acts, once a public health emergency is declared, with slight differences between the states, the chief health officer has autocratic powers. Um, I will just read you what it says in the Victorian legislation, for example, just bear with me for a moment. Um, in Victoria, in a declared public health emergency, the chief health officer can order people to be detained for as long as reasonably necessary to reduce risk to public health. He, can, he or she, I should say, can close borders and, quote, give any other direction reasonably necessary to protect public health. And it's that last one under which vaccines are being made mandatory for certain occupations, obviously, in the news at the moment, construction workers. Now, I have very little sympathy for the demonstrations we've seen on the streets. Um, I have been following their social media feeds for most of the last two days, and I've also talked to colleagues among the journalistic profession who've been on the streets at some personal risk reporting on the demonstrations. I don't think it's true to say that they're all extreme right-wing troublemakers, but there's certainly a fair proportion of right-wing troublemakers in there, as well as anti-vaccine vaccine people and others who are broadly fed up with lockdowns and concerns about the erosion of what they see as their freedoms. Um, but on this issue of do we want to make vaccines mandatory, I, you know, I find that a distasteful notion and it doesn't entirely surprise me that we're seeing this kind of reaction. Now at the moment I think the majority of Victorians would probably support the action that has been taken by the police. I think broadly I probably do too. But the thing that worries me and the thing that is different between our current times and a normal emergency if you like such as a bushfire or to echo Oliver Wendell Holmes, a war, is when does it end? Hmm. Um, when is the emergency over? Is it when we have no COVID circulating? Well, that may never happen, and it's certainly not going to happen next week or next month. Um, is it when we have some defined level of disease and death in the community that the emergency will be over? Will it be when we have a certain proportion of people vaccinated? What if there is a new variant? Um, there is no clear end point of this um, public health autocracy. Now, as I say, the, law, the laws which allow the chief health officers these powers are contained in laws passed by Parliament. We have all consented to them in much the same way that we consent to seatbelt laws um, because we recognise that duty to the community in Article 29, that fact that our freedoms cannot be completely unconstrained. Um, as the old saying goes, my freedom to swing my fist ends where your nose begins. <laughs> um, so it's that principle which is new. But what is new and I think concerning in our present situation is that we don't know when the emergency ends. Mm. And these powers might go on for a long while. And you don't have to sympathise with the demonstrators and I feel sorry for some of them, but I don't sympathise with what they're doing or with their cause, to be concerned about that. And I think we have to be careful not to be too willing to give up those, um, those freedoms and those civil rights in the, you know, under the mantra of our duty to the community. Both are obviously very important. But what's concerning to me in the current situation is that there has been no public debate. If you question public health orders, you immediately get dismissed as some sort of anti-vax idiot, and I hope you can see that I'm not that. Um, on the other hand, if you do question them, uh, if you support them, then other people will say, well, you're a fascist and, you know, Dan Andrews is a dictator and all the rest of it, which is also ridiculous. Mm. But our public debate on these issues has been so impoverished that it's impossible really to be heard to go back to my beginning, making what I hope is a more subtle point, which I think will become very important as we move from this stage of the pandemic to the next stage. Um, a few other things, other ways of limiting freedom of speech, which are to do with being heard. If one person has a megaphone and can drown out all other voices, 
then effectively they are limiting somebody else's ability to be heard, which I would suggest is limiting their freedom of speech. In our own time, just about anybody can publish. Anybody who has a computer and an internet connection can publish news and views to the world within a few minutes of deciding to do so. In many ways, I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, I've been a journalist for 40 years, I think. Um, and through most of that time, significant groups in our society have not been able to make themselves heard. Indigenous people, women very largely, people of colour more generally. Um, and social media has seen a real dem democratisation of our public space. But the downside is exactly the same. Voices that could not previously be heard can now be heard and greatly amplified. And that's playing a role in the organisation of these public demonstrations in the rise of very worrying anti-Semitism among some of the people involved in these demonstrations, in the ability of the far right to recruit at a time of you know, social disturbance and, and discontent. Um, and so this departure of the megaphone and this democratization of the ability to be heard has enormous implications for society, both good and ill. Mm. On the one hand, it wasn't so great when Rupert Murdoch could effectively control your ability to be heard, but we now have this much more widely spread ability to be heard, and it's both wonderful and very frightening at the same time. I think it has already changed just about everything. We saw how it played out in America um, when the Capitol building was raided, um, but we're just at the beginning of these changes. Mm. I think it will continue to change that. Um, I might stop there, I think, Meredith, and um, perhaps we can have some discussion. I hope that, um, as I say, please don't think that I'm some sort of anti-vaxxer and I am enormously distressed by the violent demonstrations of the last few days. I find some of the dialogue around them truly frightening, frightening as a journalist and frightening as somebody of Jewish heritage. Um, some of the material that you see on the social media channels is, is truly frightening. Yeah. Um, and yet... I think there are real issues here, and if we just pretend there aren't, I don't think we're helping. Margaret, you've raised so many really interesting points there, but I just want to pick up one, and, and that is that you are saying that it's very hard for almost reasonable voices to get a look in because, similar to America, we seem to be polarising mm. um, to on, on both extremes and that the more that happens, the more people who hopefully like us see ourselves in the sensible centre, um, we're, we're almost forced, persuaded, um, possibly forced to take sides where otherwise we might want to have that more, more balanced discussion that you were talking about. Am I summarising your stance correctly? Yes, I think that's right. I think we are seeing a more polarised media, I'm talking about mainstream media now, not social media, um, than ever before in my life in Australia. I think perhaps if you went back to the, um, you know, the anti-communist era of the 50s mm. and so on, maybe, maybe you would have seen it then too. Uh, but certainly during my lifetime, I don't think it's been as polarised as it currently is. Um, and that's concerning because it means the, um, you know, that we're, when we're all sharing the same news, it is actually a cohesive force, even if we disagree vehemently on elements of the news, at least we're starting with the same facts. And over time, that is a cohesive force. And I do, I think they've lost that in the USA. I think it's a risk here. Um, the main difference between us and the USA is that we have well-funded, not well-funded enough in my view, but nevertheless well-funded public broadcasting in mm. a way the US doesn't. Mm. And that is a real and very important force for social cohesion, mm. um, which we undermine at our peril, I think. Um, so that is a real difference. Whether it's enough of a difference to make mm. our trajectory different from that of the States, I think we will find out in the next few years. And look, I, I, can I just make one more point and then perhaps we'll take some questions um, and, and discuss those. Um, but it seems to me that uh, having had something to do with professional journalists 
And through that experience, being exposed to the sorts of skills that professional journalists really have, there are a lot of people, I think, in the general public are simply unaware of the sorts of things that journalists process when before they publish, before they write. And those are skills and, and dare I say, values that are really, really uh, uh, valuable. So moving to now a, um, a situation where anybody can get published on social media. So we've taken out that layer of professional journalism that um, previously, I think, had a moderating effect on what people read in their media. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I mean, it's still there, of course, but it is possible now to access news. Um, I'd say fake news, but um, news and views without the mediation of professional journalism. And, of course, I'm get, Sorry. Yeah, and, and, you know, you might have, we might have been concerned about uh, the monopoly that is Rupert Murdoch, but even on social media, um, the people, the, the, the social media posts that most people read are the ones that are either very extreme or they've got a lot of money behind them. Well, it depends, Meredith. It depends on the algorithms, which and one of the worrying things about the power of the social media platforms is that those algorithms are in no way transparent. Mm. But it means that your social media feed will be very different from mine. Mm. And both of our social media feeds are going to be a completely different from one of those people who are on the steps of the shrine this afternoon. We don't know what they're seeing. It's certainly different from what we're seeing and the power over what they see is in the hands of these algorithms um, run by the Facebooks, et cetera. Um, well, essentially run by the owners of social media, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, as opposed to Rupert Murdoch. So yes, you know, is but, one better than the other? Well, the difference is, of course, first of all, um, Rupert was relatively transparent. If you buy, and still the case, if you buy one of his newspapers, you get the same content I get if I buy that newspaper and um, we know what's in there, whatever we think of it. Whereas if you have a Facebook account, the stuff you're getting fed is different from what I get. And I have no visibility on what you're getting and vice versa. Right. So it is different. Right. And, you know, more worrying, I think. Yeah, indeed. Let's um, see if we can take some of the questions and uh, see what comes from that. Um there were a number of questions that were sent in beforehand, so I'm going to go through those before I start taking the questions from the chat box. Uh, so this is a question from Tanya Marwood, who unfortunately couldn't be with us. She, at the last minute, um, had something else to go to, so she'll have to pick this up on the, uh, on the replay. So Tanya says, how can we get people to accept that their rights to freedom of speech also come with responsibilities to avoid doing harm to others? Well, a big question. I wish I had a simple answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, there is real disagreement about this among people of goodwill, leaving aside, you know, the racists and the extremists that we have seen active in the last few days, not only in the last few days. Uh, for example, um, there is Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. Hmm. Um, which I actually oppose. I, is that the only thing I agree with Andrew Bolt on? <laughs> um, I actually think it does go too far when it says, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's something like you must not offend people. Offend, do have to be, offend or insult. Yes, I think we do have to put up with being offended and insulted mm. rather than limit freedom of speech. I uh, the RSA agrees with you. Yes, I think that section goes too far. Um, and as I say, Andrew Bolt and I, I think, that is the only thing we would agree on. And I argued that at the time that he was facing, um, was it the courts or the Discrimination Commission? I can't remember now. But um, when he was having his legal case over that anyway, I actually agreed with his view, which a bit of a shock to all, I think. Um, so, you know, there is, but many, many people, of course, were vehemently against him mm. and thought that that was an entirely appropriate balance between the rights to freedom of speech 
Um, so yes, I I am more in favour of freedom of speech than many on the left these days, and that worries me too. I think we are too ready to um, to be offended and to think offence is sufficient to limit somebody else's right to speech. And you know, I think that's wrong in principle, but there's also a pragmatic thing. If you limit somebody's right to speak in the public realm, they don't go away. You know, particularly in these days, they will speak elsewhere. They will circulate on social media and it's out of sight. And so any hope we have of weighing your freedom with your responsibility becomes more remote because they move further out of reach. I think we're much better off having these debates in public. So, you know, we, we don't have a consensus on where that balance is to be struck. Mm. You know, some people would censor J.K. Rowling's books, for example, yes, right. um, which I think is ridiculous myself. Um, but lots of people would disagree with me. Lots of people would cancel her now because she has given offence. Yes. Let me move on to another question from Brigitte. Uh, who says this is a very topical subject. It'd be interesting if Margaret could include touching on the COVID-19 protesters, which I think we have, mm -hmm. and racism as well, which perhaps you've done a bit, uh, because in a crisis, people often say and do things that they would normally not say or do. So maybe the, the point about that question is when we are in times of crisis as individuals, do we behave in ways that perhaps we wouldn't otherwise? Oh, I think the answer to that is yes, I'm sure. Certainly, if I reflect on my own behaviour over this last, how long is it, year and a half? Um, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure all of us, if we're honest, reflect on our own behaviour, both in our personal lives and in our public lives. Mm -hmm. And we have not always managed to be our best selves. These have been incredibly difficult times. Mm. But yes, of course. Because so stressful. Yes, it's stressful and we're frightened. Mm. I mean, I am, you know, when I say I'm frightened by some of what I've seen on the social media channels over the last few days, I really mean it. I mean, journalists, there was some discussion of marching on the headquarters of Channel 9, which is also home to the age, of course, these days, you know, which I write for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, colleagues, people I know who've been reporting on the streets have been attacked. Um, there was talk on one of these social media channels today of marching on the ABC building. Um, you know, the mainstream media, as they call us, is one of the objects of attack, just as it was in the USA. Mm. So I'm frightened as a journalist um, and I'm frightened of somebody of Jewish ancestry because there's a lot of anti-Semitism wrapped up in this. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, this is, I am very frightened and, and of course, one has to try and keep that in control in one's public behaviour. And do yeah. we always manage it? I'd be very surprised if we do. Margaret, I've got a, uh, a question from um, one of our long-term members, Aziz Islam, uh, and I'm not quite sure what he's referring to, but you might recognise this. He says, what do you know and can tell us about Event 201? Absolutely nothing, sorry. Right. I, I don't know what he's talking about either. Um, but he had a second part of the question, which is, do you think there should be a WHO or UN investigation into possible bioengineering of the virus? Hmm. So I think that is about whether it's um, manufactured in a lab in Wuhan hmm. or, or um, mutated naturally from bats or whatever. I hmm. think that's what he's getting at there. Um, yes, of course, you know, we should know as much as we can about that. Mm. Um, my understanding, and I have no particular expertise in this, but I have read everything I've been able to on it. My understanding is that the weight of the evidence is towards it being a natural mutation, but it's not certain. Yeah. It may have been a lab escape. And of course, we should know as much as we can. And of course, the Chinese should be releasing any information or documentation they have to settle the issue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, of course. Of course, a journalist is going to say we should <laughs> yes. have an investigation and have as much information as possible. So, yes, I think so. But I don't think it's a settled question. Um, I think some of what the Australian have been publishing on it is pretty tendentious. Um, but I don't think I don't know which is true. And I don't think anybody does, really. Mm. Um, 
Here's a comment from Barbara Pinelli. She says, and you'll hopefully enjoy this, she says she's been enjoying a couple of Margaret's books through lockdown. Thank you. Nice. Very keen to hear this talk. Um, she mentions uh, your biography of Penny Wong and also your writing about gardens. Do you want to make just a couple of, off to the side of it, but make a couple of comments about writing political biographies? And then, interestingly, you also write books about gardens. Yes, a lot of people find this challenging. It's as though one could only be one thing. <laughs> um, I mean, the Australian, when they were on my case about 10 years ago, because they regarded I was one of the people that they periodically attack ages ago now and nobody remembers except me but um but they used the fact that I was a gardening writer to attack me and they said you know a gardening writer Margaret Simons as though this was something which I should be ashamed of anyway um so of course the common element between political biography and gardening is muckraking <laughs> <laughs> but um gardening is my main hobby um, and I am the kind of person who ends up writing about just about anything they do at some point or other. So the two just kind of happen. Right. I see no contradiction between them, really. Um, I enjoy writing about gardening, whereas I often find um, the political writing very difficult. Uh. Um, writing about gardening just gives me pleasure. Oh, well, you, you're much more in control of your gardens. <laughs> well, <laughs> like to think so. <laughs> Um, one last one from the questions, or uh, this may be a comment, actually, that came in, and then we'll get to the uh, questions on the chat box. From Marie Wade, she says, I believe a civil society is one whose priority, who prioritises the needs of the most vulnerable. This benefits the whole of society when the common good of all is applied. The individual will also benefit when the whole of society is functioning to support everybody. I think we can sort of take that as a comment, but it is, is it a comment that you would agree with? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and we fall a long way short on it most of the time. Mm. And one of the reasons why I have been an optimist about social media, something which, you know, is very challenged at the moment, has been precisely because some of the people who have been invisible to us are now visible. Mm in ways which social media has enabled. And I think it's important to remember that as well as being aware of the dangers that we're seeing. Right. Yeah. From Clive Bond, um, he asks the question about the limits to free speech. Who is best able to set those limits? Well, in a democracy, it has to be us. But the problem is... But we all have different limits. Yes, we do. But if we want to live together in a society, we have to come to consensus in the same way that we do on the traffic laws. And most of the time, we kind of do. Like, you know, even the most libertarian will usually agree that child pornography should not be allowed, mm. for example. Hardly anybody would argue for complete unfettered freedom of speech once you get down to it. Mm -hmm. And once you've, you know, I've had this argument with libertarians, once they've agreed that maybe child pornography should be restricted, it's then about where you draw the line, right? And there is plenty of room for people of goodwill to disagree on where to draw the line. But in a democratic society, we work these things out by consensus and end up with a situation that we all more or less agree with most of the time. And, of course, there will always be tensions in particular cases and mm. the consensus can shift over time. Um, but a lot of things have happened very quickly. Coronavirus and the restrictions and the controversies over demonstrations and so on have happened extremely quickly. Mm. But before that, social media has happened extremely quickly. Mm. Relatively. And, yeah. Twitter was only embedded in 2013. Mm. Now, if you think about the, um, the printing press that was invented, I can't remember the exact date, but it was the late 1400s. Th th 1341. Thank you. Okay. 1341. I, I, I might be correct. <laughs> And Milton's speech to Parliament was in 1600. Mm. Okay, so you had centuries before people realised the implications and began to argue about concepts like freedom of speech and the public interest, mm. all of which, you know, the whole notion of the public was created by mass media. Mm. Before that, that notion didn't really make sense. You know, mm. people who didn't know each other but were in some way connected, that's only possible because of mass media, the printing press. 
One of the things that you say uh, is about um, that we should have time to debate these issues and e almost evolve a consensus. Um, but just recently, we've we've observed because we've had no chance to be involved. We've observed a major change to the strategic and political direction of our country, of my nation, with. Um, a very small number of people deciding that we would go into a strategic alliance which has really shifted, uh, even symbolically, if not um, uh, physically, the balance of power, where, where the, our role in our nation. So are we seeing a, a, a slow but, but sure shift towards a much more authoritarian uh, government? I don't think I would argue that, no. Um, I mean, I agree with you about the significance of the decision. I think it's an enormously significant decision. Um, you know, one of those generational changes, if you like. Mm. Um, but, you know, I don't suppose Chifley held a referendum before he decided to... Um, sever the United Kingdom in favour of the states during the Second World War. Um, we elected this government, for better or worse. Um, maybe we didn't, but they were elected through a democratic process. Um, it's within their powers to make this decision. Whether it's a good decision or a bad decision, I don't know. I mean, it's been implemented very badly. I have travelled extensively in China. I still teach Chinese students. I have many Chinese friends among the universities and academics there. And there is no doubt that the China I first began to visit in 2010 has changed enormously. Xi Jinping has changed the direction of the country in ways that are terrifying. The human rights abuses, obviously, to people like the Uyghur are horrifying. There are concentration camps being erected. Mm. Um, even at universities, where when I was first visiting China, speech was relatively free in universities, um, providing you didn't take it on the street, so to speak. You could have a debate in a university classroom in China in much the same way you would in Melbourne. You can't now. Things have changed hugely. Mm. So China is very worrying. Um, we can't just pretend it's not there. We can't just not spend on defence and pretend that we're not at risk. Whether going all the way with the USA is the right answer, I don't know. I mean, it certainly puts the end to any sort of notion that we might have been able to be some sort of Switzerland in the Pacific mm. in the, you know, coming conflict, which I hope remains a Cold War and not a hot one. Yeah, indeed. Let's just get back to the vaccines. Um, Marie says, how do we protect vulnerable people if their professional carer chooses not to be vac vaccinated, as with nurses, paramedics, doctors in aged care and disability. Mm. How do we protect those people? I mean, you know, I hear what you say about you're uncomfortable with the idea of mandating vaccines, yeah. but, but what if somebody chooses not to be vaccinated, but they are in a carer position, vis or in, yes, a carer position vis-a-vis -vis somebody who is very vulnerable? Yeah. Well, this is, you know, that balancing act between Article 29 and Articles 1 and 3 of the human rights. Um, I mean, if we say to somebody, you may not work in this occupation, be it healthcare or construction, unless you have a jab, are we mandating the vaccine? I think there is a difference between that. You know, we're saying you can't be a construction worker, but you can, to quote John Secker, go and pick fruit in Mildura <laughs> and not have the jab. Mm. And for me, that is a reasonable balance, um, certainly for healthcare workers, for the aged care workers who look after my father, for example. For me, that's a reasonable balance. School teachers, yes, probably. Construction workers, well, you know, I wouldn't have anticipated that they would be on that line, but apparently they are, if we believe the chief health officer. One of the questions which I have is whether that mandate will continue indefinitely. Mm. This is one of the things about when is the emergency over. We might say, right, right now, huge amounts of transmission are handing in, hang, happening in construction sites 
there's huge compliance issues which you know they've been warned and they haven't been solved and so for now we're going to make it mandatory mm. will we still be doing that in six months a year two years mm. you know when is the emergency over mm. this is one of the problems i don't think anybody knows the answer to that question i don't suppose the chief health officer or dan andrews knows the answer to that question at the moment and unfortunately we forget because other things overtake the front pages and so these things remain on the back burner and are not challenged. And the Australian Human Rights Commission, if you look at the material they have on their website about COVID, they say, you know, human rights can be compatible with emergency measures, which I think is true because of that balancing act. But they also talk about being worried about creeping authoritarianism, the fact that so many of these decisions are being made in national cabinet, which is in no way transparent. Hmm. Um that sometimes, not so much in Victoria, but certainly in New South Wales, the data on which the decisions are being made isn't being made transparent. You know, so they talk about creeping authoritarianism and, and that's what worries me. Mm. So do I think it reasonable for a nurse to have to have a vaccine in order to look after patients? Yes, I think I do, because she or he doesn't have to be a nurse. They could choose some other occupation. Mm. But where do we draw the line and when do we stop exercising this very high degree of power over people these are questions i'm not sure about i'm thinking about them every day and they worry me robert bender has a comment which um sort of touches on this and he refers to john stuart mill and the argument that people shouldn't have their freedoms limited for their own good but only to prevent them harming others and he goes on to say, I got vaccinated partly to protect myself, but even more to protect others from me, including hospital staff being overwhelmed by very sick people. It's a harm minimization exercise. Similarly, people spreading mischievous misinformation, which dissuades people from accepting vaccination is socially very harmful. So restraining them is important. The emergency, which induced governments to make seatbelts and crash helmets mandatory, will never be over either. It's mainly about limiting the burden on the hospital system, leaving space for people not eager to expose themselves to personal injury. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think I agree with you, Robert. Um, but we have seen through the COVID emergency an enormous uptick in government power over the everyday lives of citizens. I mean, you know, curfews, military on the streets, things which, you know, in other circumstances would completely horrify us. Mm. Personally, I accept the public health argument for that. I am vaccinated for a very similar mix of reasons to Robert. Um, but for how long? Mm. For how long? When does this emergency end and how will we decide, given that the risk is clearly never going to go or most likely never going to disappear or probably not in our lifetimes is going to disappear. You know, at what point do we decide that we would rather take a level of risk than give up these liberties? And how are we going to make that decision as a society? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, Robert Digman says to everybody, if we agree that the pen is mightier than the sword, then we need to ensure that those who wield the pen don't go into the town square waving it around, cutting other people. Hmm. Yeah, well... But do, but do we? Because, you know, do, do pens cut? I mean, swords cut. Do, do pens cut? Well, you know, that phrase, you know, the, the pen is mightier than the sword is usually, usually used in the context of persuasion. Hmm. You know, that you're more likely to change minds with words than with force. Um, so, you know, I don't think a pen literally cuts, no, but it can change minds and, and that, you know, that is a very powerful thing. Um, in terms of spreading misinformation, I mean, you know, I wrote the piece in the Sydney Morning Herald that um, got Meredith to invite me here tonight and, you know, ended up saying that I really have no problems with YouTube booting Sky News off its platform for spreading misinformation. But, of course, sometimes something which somebody dismisses as misinformation might turn out, in fact, to be correct. Um, for example, our medical experts had a huge debate up until just a few months ago about whether or not the virus was airborne. 
Mm. Um, and I think now the weight of the evidence is, yes, it is, you know, and that's why I'm asking. But isn't that, but isn't, that, isn't that because there was a paucity of information about how the virus worked at first? So people were struggling to, to, to work out how it worked. It's not that they were trying to suppress information. They were seriously facing a lack of well-grounded information. Well, I don't know if you followed the debate, Meredith, but it was very heated. Um, and certainly there were some, and I'm not talking about, you know, anti-vaxxers or rat bags here. I'm talking about credentialed medical experts in senior positions mm. who were saying that other people should shut up because they were wrong. Right. Now, you know, I think it has now been resolved. I think the way to, I don't think there's much argument about it anymore, but there really was for a while. Mm -hmm. Um and it was sorted out, ultimately, by the evidence, but, you know, it, while we were still dealing with it. And mm -hmm. had, had we known more earlier, we would have been worrying a lot, lot less about washing hands and, you know, washing our groceries when we bought them into the house, yes. and a lot more about mask wearing and avoiding stuffy rooms. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it was a real deficit in the knowledge, yes, but certainly during the debate there were people who were wanting to suppress speech from those of a different view. Yeah. Clive Bond asks, um, and this relates to your view about how long should these things, these restrictions go on for, should there be a sunset clause on all emergency legislation? Well, there is. Um, mm. The state of emergency has to be re, um, re endorsed, if you like, by Parliament at regular intervals. But the chief health officer, and I'm not having a go at Brett Sutton here, I think he's amazing. I've had the privilege of interviewing him a few times, and I think he's an extraordinary human being. But, um, you know, but the chief health officer, I'm talking about the officer rather than the individual, mm -hmm. um, has the power to declare a public health emergency and then the powers, once he or she has done that, and then has the power to, you know, do pretty much anything, including set curfews and mandate vaccines for certain mm. occupations mm. Uh, and any other thing the legislation says to protect public health. Yes, but realistically, the CHO uh, would not do that in an autocratic way. I mean, they surely would be consulting with other people in the government to find out how where to draw the balance. Well, yes, and he does, but, mm. um, but some people would say he's got it wrong. A number of, I don't think he would claim to have always got it right himself. I reported on the public housing lockdowns, for example, last mm -hmm. March, in which people, basically because they were public housing tenants, were locked down completely with absolutely no notice. Hasn't happened before yeah. or since in yeah. this country. Yeah. Um, and the reason the, that happened to them and not to people who live in private apartments, for example, is this assumption that because they're poor, and because they're, many of them are not white, that therefore it must be some sort of hotbed of criminality and non-compliance. Mm. Now, I have to say that this time around, when there have been outbreaks in public housing towers, the government has handled it exactly the same as they've handled private apartment mm. towers, and that's what should have been done. But was that over the top, wrong, autocratic? The ombudsman certainly said so. She said it was a breach of those people's human rights, and I think she was right. And... It hasn't happened since. No. So it, I, I think it was generally agreed that it was a mistake, but at least they've learned from the mistake. Yes, and credit to them for that. But I was on the ground reporting it, and it was quite some mistake. There were still people in a state of trauma because of it. Mm. Okay. Margaret, it's 8.30 and we probably need to wrap this up, but can I do that by just asking you one last question, and that is... Yeah thinking about the future and the way that the trends are going, um, are you optimistic or pessimistic? I mean, do, do, you, do, do you see that our democratic institutions are robust enough, resilient enough to be able to cope with the, the real emergency, not only in the pandemic sense, but in a freedoms uh, sense, to be able to cope with those and bring back some degree of the sort of normality that we've been used to in the past? Well, I don't think 
we're ever going to go to the past. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're ever going to go back to the normal we've known in the past. There are a lot of reasons why that isn't going to happen. Sure. And sure. we have to get used to it and try and work out how to carry our principles into the future. Um, you know, what we need to adapt, what perhaps we can let go, what we need to defend. You know, we have to do that because there is no going back. It's not going back to how it was in the past. It just isn't. There are a lot of reasons why that's not going to happen. Am I optimistic or pessimistic? I'm optimistic by nature. I'm sort of wired for optimism. And sometimes I think that causes me to be foolishly optimistic. Mm. Um, at the moment, I, you know, I find these questions very challenging. And I think my children and grandchildren are going to have, have much harder lives than I have had. We have been the lucky generation. Mm. We haven't Absolutely. faced um, one of these major challenges, such as war, on a, you know, in our home countries anyway, on a big scale, such as major disease. Um, and they are going to face all these things as climate change as well. And, um, and, and have to work out ways of building institutions that can cope with them. Mm. So, you know, it seems to me I'm, I'm 62, um, obviously closer to the end of my career than the beginning. Um, it seems to me that what I can most usefully do is to try and help with thinking that through. But it's a great mistake, I think, to want to go backwards because we can't. Mm. We have to go forwards. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, a kind of moral failure, really, to just be all nostalgic about the past. And, you know, there's a lot wrong with the past as well. Not, yeah. not Sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't meaning to be nostalgic about the past, not at all. I, I guess I was really thinking, you know, in the next 20, 30 years, are the, the democratic institutions that we are used to, are they going to be resilient enough to be able to deal with this difficult period that we're going through? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. But, you know, one of, one of in a different forums, I have been arguing in the last few weeks for journalists to get much better at using social media, mm -hmm. whereas many journalists, because of the abuse they suffer, are wanting to withdraw from it. Well, mm. I think that's a terrible idea. Mm. Um, you know, in a country where a quarter of people use social media as their main source of news, if mm. journalists withdraw, then we're leaving an incredibly dangerous mm. landscape. So what I'm arguing for journalists to get better at it. Mm. Um, and, you know, more broadly, I think we all have some duty there. Mm. You know, we should all uh, be participating in these forums to the best mm -hmm. of our abilities as responsible citizens. Indeed. Because if we don't, we leave it to the irresponsible citizens. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Margaret, we must um, wrap this up. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Um, a, a voice of reason, may I say, and honorary member of the Rationalist Society, therefore. <laughs> but thank you very much on behalf of all of us. And to those of you out there, please... Um, uh, join us at our next RSA webinar where we'll have not one but two um, stellar speakers to speak to you about religious freedom, not just freedom of speech, but uh, religious freedom, the state of religious freedom. Marion Maddox is a name that many of you will know. She's a very eminent scholar of religion and politics. It was she who uh, wrote the book God mm -hmm. Under Howard. And uh, we'll also be joined by Eleni Poulos, who's an ordained minister, and she's just completed a PhD under Marion Maddox, um, focusing on religious freedom. So please watch out for uh, information about our next uh, RSA webinar next month, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.